Thank you very much, uh, Louise. And uh, yes, a very good evening from, from Sydney, Australia. Good afternoon to everybody uh, uh, tuning in today. Um, just uh, gonna sort of shape up uh, just by sharing my screen, if I if I may, just to kind of kick things off to kind of set the scene. Um, just uh, as you heard a bit of an intro from myself, um, I'm also Chief Strategy Officer, Brand Futurist for uh, Sorted Stone, a, a digital agency um, uh, with a, a number of team members around the country. Uh, including North America and EMEA, and also I head up the APAC kind of side of things here in Australia. Um, I wanted to just sort of start by by sharing with you guys, just just you know, setting the scene about how things have changed uh, in this in this crazy COVID kind of area uh, that we live in around our marketing. This was just some stats I saw about open rates, just out of interest um, across all regions, from APAC to EMEA to North America and LATAM, and you can see that open rates sort of pretty much as COVID hit started to open up. People were more engaging across their email than I suppose ever before, which was great for, for marketers. What was also good for marketers was ad spend was down. As you can see here, again, across multiple different industries from computer software through to travel and manufacturing, uh, the spend dropped tremendously. So uh, certainly for, for ourselves and for some of our clients, we actually had the ability in a, in a number of areas to increase our ad spend and have a lot more effect in paid media during this, this period because it was less cluttered than it had been before. I think one of the things that we've kind of found as well is that people are spending a lot more time on their mobile devices and uh, a bunch of different devices. This was just again a stat but back in April 2020, just as the, the, the height of the pandemic started, which showed a lot more increase in, in people using various kind of um, smartphones as well as laptops and anything kind of digital to connect with the internet and obviously go online. Um, I noted also back in December 2019, Zoom had around 10 million uh, daily users. Um, by a few months into the pandemic, at the height of the pandemic, that had grown to 300 million daily meeting participants. So uh, we're obviously uh, maybe feeling a little bit zoomed out with some of those kind of stats. But one of the things I think as marketers we're trying to do is, is constantly remove that friction. Um, you know, and the friction is that difference between the way things are and the way things should be um, across our whole buyer journey. Um, in fact, again, statistics, just to throw those at you, 61% of, uh, of marketers say that um, they're altering their short-term strategy, most of them to reduce the friction and try and do things a lot more seamlessly. Um, yet 9% of those are only making, are not making many plans at the moment for their long-term uh, strategy. So a lot of short-term kind of effects are, are happening in play. Deloitte, Deloitte did some research as well, finding that 75% of consumers expect to have this consistent um, interaction across every department of the business, for, from marketing to sales to service, this kind of seamless approach. So hence, you know, the, the kind of flywheel concept now comes into play as opposed to the typical funnel that we've all been so used to. So, you know, attract, convert, close and delight are now kind of forming around our key departments within our organization of marketing, sales and service. And, and we're starting to feel this kind of streamlined approach to everything we do. And as that comes the connected brand. And really as brands today, we need to be thinking about these three key areas, I believe, brand engagement, buyer behavior and, and a growth stack, a tech stack that's gonna drive a lot of the automation and the things that people wanna hear and see from you. And bridge between those, between brand engagement and buyer behavior is that conversational marketing approach between the brand engagement and the tech stack or the growth stack is marketing automation. And on the other side of the coin between the growth or tech stack and the buyer behavior is where our sales enablement needs to come into play. So I think we're moving towards having far more of this connected brand, which is enabling us to create the omni-channel frictionless experience. And I think that's the utopia of what we're, we're aiming to do. And hopefully some of those insights that you'll hear from in our presentations today about how do we create that seamless kind of omni-channel experience that we're, that we're all trying and striving to achieve. So without any further ado, just a quick intro to kind of set the scene. Uh, we have uh, some fantastic speakers coming up. And the first uh, I'm going to introduce now, uh, Group Digital Enablement Head for Multi-Choice Group South Africa is gonna share with us his thoughts on winning the hearts, minds of your audience in an age of digital chaos. So please welcome um, our first presenter, Vincent Mayer. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm just going to share screen. Uh, if you give me one second here, and then uh, we'll be good to go. Um, so there. Um, 
All good, we're seeing what's happening on my screen. I'm going to assume so. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about winning hearts and minds of your audience. Um, I think for me, one of the key areas here really is around talking about audience, audience data, and how you use this to cut through the noise from a marketing perspective. And just some context about myself. Um, I'm not a marketer, <clears throat> although for my sins, I've been a CMO in the past. Um, I'm very much a tooling person uh, focused on digital delivery, but um, have a very strong passion for the marketing technology and the techniques and, and processes around um, you know, building precision marketing at scale. So <clears throat> what I'm doing at MultiChoice in terms of uh, digital enablement is really working between the technology teams that are, are building applications and software and the marketers who need to um, you know, drive adoption of either content through those channels that are, are being built by those teams um, or the teams that are using that same or very similar set of technology to drive monetization through the form of media sales. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I think the the challenge that most of us face as consumers and users of digital applications is that we're tired of fake news and paid influences and kind of everything that marketers have managed to create over the years. It's just a lot of it. Um, there are a lot of cookies and there's a lot of concern around privacy and you know, even now I think um, as the sort of first wave of commercial WhatsApp. Uh, bots are, are hitting the streets, um, there's like rising concern that that's going to become quite a, a noisy space as well. Um, and in fact, last week I received the first unsolicited uh, push notification from, from a WhatsApp business bot. So uh, I think that's it's going to become increasingly worrying. So the, the real challenge is how do you create uh, messages and communication that, that cuts through all of this um, and, and really creates value in, in the lives of, I guess, the users. Um, so the opportunity really is that um, we don't need a lot of attention to get our message across. Um, for those of you who've read this, you'll be familiar with this, but last year the Mobile Marketing Association published their co cognition study where they found that uh, you know, despite I think the standard being like a three second video ad view or something like that, it takes, it actually takes less than half a second to process the video ad and form an opinion about it. So, um, you know, despite all the clutter, the, the actual time frame that we have to be successful is pretty short. Um, and so for that, you need something that looks really good and is well targeted and um, has a high level of relevance from the consumer perspective. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you get to that. Um, so I, I think, generally speaking, when you build campaigns that involve a lot of data and a lot of targeting, you you aim towards getting it as person-centric as possible in terms of your messaging, campaign design, et cetera. Um, and this really does involve several different areas. So the first one is around just the, the kind of core function of being able to identify people and distinguish them from each other. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how each of these different things work, but this is kind of at the heart of it. If you can't do this, uh, you're not really going to be able to, to get very far. Um, and then there's the, the broader process around data collection and how you apply this um, and make this effective. Um, and then attached to that is the process of how you actually seg segregate that data, create segmentation, etc. cetera. Um, and then finally, what do you actually do with it? So how do you customize campaigns? How do you customize uh, user journeys or digital experiences around this data that you've, you've been able to collect? So I've spent quite a bit of time working with DMPs um, over the past couple of years, uh, specifically in context where we've either been doing like really high net serving and creating private audience networks. Um, 
and in multi-choice at the moment. And I'm going to talk a little bit through a multi-choice case study later on where this actually worked really well for us. Um, we use a DMP, we use Google Marketing Platform, and we have all of this stuff connected so that we can push audience data from our mobile apps into our media buying apps and, and kind of seamlessly um, target and, and share data across our different um, channels and also our different buying teams. Um, so I think when we just look generally at identification, there are a couple of things at play here. So, so the first one would be um, what technology you put down. Uh, and there are a variety of different routes to go with this, like ranging from having a standalone DMP uh, stack, which like kind of does DMP stuff really well, to something more broader, like a customer data platform, which sort of is a hybrid uh, in many ways between like a CRM and a DMP. Um, and then whatever marketing platform you're gonna be using. And those are the things that need to talk to each other from a you know, technical standpoint, um, but also from an operational uh, flow of data perspective. Um, I think the majority of South African media buyers are, are using Google and Facebook as their two primary things. I mean, some of them are using other DSPs, but generally speaking, that's what it's gonna be. The other factor is that um, the, the rise and arguably the fall, although it's not gonna be the fall of DMPs is the, what's kind of been deemed cookie geddon or the cookie apocalypse, which is coming, busy happening right now where third party audience data cookies are being blocked by browsers. Um, in discussions that, that I've been having with, with uh, various DMP providers, most of them are quite confident that they've found a way around it and they're really not too concerned about the fact that third party cookies are gonna go away. We will see obviously what happens with that. But I think that it's part of a broader move in sentiment away from, um, from, from consumers to want to protect their data a little bit more. And um, you, you're not going to necessarily find that the existence of the third party data world is going to be as strong as it has historically, but consequently also it's probably going to be better governed and have much better management of that data. And people are going to have more control over what you know about them. So there, there's probably going to be quite a shift towards uh, emphasis on first party data. And that's where having a, a CDP can be really powerful for yourself. Um, the other thing that has proven quite difficult is identifying uh, individuals across different channels, uh, especially in an environment where you're not dealing with a lot of logged in users can be pretty challenging. Um, Oftentimes the technology will actually handle this for you, um, but you know, you, you're still gonna be in a situation where you're probably gonna be speaking to some person more than once as they, they switch channels. Um, and I can speak from experience when I say that m merging your offline data with your DMP data can be pretty hard. Um, so to give you an example of, of where we've managed to execute this quite well, um, we we push a lot of our CRM data like anonymously into the DMP at the moment when when people log in to consume a self service product or or something like that, and that's really helped us to connect, I guess like your predominantly anonymous audience profile in the DMP with um, your known customer account inside of a CRM. So that's that's identification on the data collection side. Um, the you'd often be surprised at how, how rich uh, segmentation you can generate just purely by, by tracking browsing behavior in a DMP. So for example, uh, we have a lot of content rich sites and every time a person looks at a piece of content on these properties, we're logging what genre, what format, what um, actors, uh, what kind of uh, sort of themes there are in the content. So it gives us quite rich segmentation. Um, but it does take effort and passion uh, to do this. Like you can't just put it on and let it run. It's something that you know is some. You you ultimately find yourself um, if you if you neglect it, it's going to become meaningless. Um, and there are certain types of people 
like generally not actually analytics people, but more people who are passionate about communication, who, t who tend to get really involved in, in sort of monitoring the segments and suggesting new ones and so on. Um, and I've got a point there that look back is useful. Um, this is just a practical note really um, for those who, who may be at the point of, of looking at getting technology and to do this kind of thing. It is useful to be able to create segments that have looked back into past events rather than only fill up in a forward facing way because it gives you the flexibility to sort of chop and change the way you do segmentation without having to wait for segments to fill up. Um, and then when you get down to segmentation itself, um, what I found generally is it's better to start big and then get smaller. Um, to start with broad segments, um, you know, maybe some implied demographic data or, or broad interest categories. Uh, and because often what you find is that um, the smaller the segments are, the potentially less valuable they become because your effort to reward ratio just ramps up as you have to create custom creative, et cetera, for, you know, for smaller segments. Um, but it's definitely a blend of science and art. Um, and the reason that I say this is that a lot of the time you're going to start with an idea around the segment and you can experiment with it by creating it and then running some campaigns against it, see how it performs, et cetera. Um, and, a lot of that is kind of the, you know, your own understanding about how your audience is and so on. Um, the tools can help you discover new segments, obviously, but every now and then, you know, a good creative idea around segmentation can go a really long way. Um, and you need to think about segments not as standalone things, but rather as a series of overlapping circles. So, you know, and, and this is more like part of the, I guess, taxonomy conversation is how, how how sort of narrowly defined are your segments or do you define them broad but then create segments of segments uh, you know if you want to sort of look at overlaps and stuff like that um and then the most important part obviously is what do you do with this audience data while while you have it um and <laughs> i think like there are a couple of points here so so firstly the the integrations between the tooling that you use is are very important, right? So you're going to need whatever's holding your data to be able to talk to your media buying platform, your analytics tools, potentially your CRM, uh, your social media management tools, and so on. Um, so that's really important. And what you're going to find is that there is for each business it's different, but there's kind of a sweet spot between one-to-one um, -one marketing and kind of segment marketing in a sense. Um, you know, every now and then someone will say like, well, we're marketing to an audience of one. And my general response is, okay, so what are you doing? Are you creating like a hundred million uh, creatives that are all different? It's possible to do that, but um, is it really worthwhile? You know, so you you find you find the sweet spot as you do this more and more. And it's really about balancing creative effort versus reward. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to win in this space. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just going to talk you through uh, a case study because I'm also aware, like I'm kind of approaching time yet. Um, and I do want to keep on schedule properly. Um, but the case study that I'm going to talk through is, is for Big Brother Nigeria. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you know what Big Brother is, but, uh, it's very, very popular in Nigeria. Um, the latest season ended, um, very recently, um, and the numbers are absolutely staggering. I mean, there were close to a billion votes in Big Brother Niger, so massive. Um, and and this, this is the breakdown of the case study, right? So firstly, just to set some context, the DMP that we used was Oracle Blue Kai. Um, it's not exactly a great performer in the DMP world, um, but it was the one that we had to work with for this. Um, we also used Apps Flyer, which is a... Um, uh, it's hard to explain what AppFlyer is. It basically does app install attribution, uh, but it also builds audiences um, and provides link deep linking services for mobile apps. Um, and our, our big platform in, in Nigeria is our mobile app. So a lot of the traffic goes through there. So what we did here was we took offline, well, disconnected anonymous voting behavior data um, from the previous Big Brother season 
and we fed that into the DMP. Then, and that created one segment, and then we created a custom audience using Apps Flyer, and this was using all the people that had recently installed our mobile app in Nigeria, so it was a group of very fresh profiles in there. Um, and then we created a control group that didn't have any targeting except that it excluded the other two segments. And we pushed those into Facebook. We ran the exact same creative over the same period. And you can see the results here, right? So the comparative C C CPM over those three weeks um, that we ran this test, you can see that the, um, the control group obviously was the cheapest. Um, and that's obviously because of the lack of targeting inside of Facebook. Um, the DMP group was a beautiful middle and actually ending up cheaper than the control group at the end from a CPM perspective. Um, and we pushed fairly substantial budgets through this. So it wasn't like a test of, you know, like a thousand dollars. Um, and then the, the key result is engagement, right? So if you look at the, the first week, we saw the DMP having two and a half times better engagement than control. It sort of equaled out in the second week and then uh, grew again in the third week. And the differences in terms of like engagement and the fluctuation of the engagement over the period was really related to what was going on in the voting because each week has a slightly different voting scenario. So, so from this, we concluded that uh, a lot of things that we already knew, but, but that we actually had evidence of, which is firstly that even though some data can be a little bit old, um, as long as uh, it hasn't fully expired, um, you can really extract a lot of value from it. So taking the previous voters, we had a clear indication of that these people were more likely to want to vote than people in the control group. And you can see that in the results like resoundingly. Um, and, <clears throat> and the thing that surprised us though was the, the recalculation of the CPM in the third week. So despite the fact that um, the ratio of uh, engagement to cost really ramped up, the cost actually decreased at the same time, um, which was a little bit odd. Um, and, and I think like there was a lot to be learned just around that because obviously the, you know, Facebook's algorithms also optimized around that engagement. So um, I think that this, if I look at how, how we locate this case study in our broader organization, um, the, the conversation has always been around, well, you do a lot of work with data, um, what kind of business value does it create? And the two clear answers are cost efficiency and then uh, like broadly performance against goals. Um, so that's really the case study that I wanted to share with you. Um, and I think just in general around this topic, I mean, I'm not saying that the only way you win the hearts and minds is to get good targeting using a DMP or some kind of data technology. But what I'm saying is it's part of um, part of the, the broader pro project of creating great communication to make sure that you're not saying irrelevant things to people who like disengaged with your message. Um, so I thought I'd share a little slides. Um, I think that's my time is up exactly correct. Uh, I had 20 minutes. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing screen and uh, I guess we're going to talk when we when we get into the networking session. Just, um, Vincent, thank you very much. Just one quick question, if we can, just a bit of interaction yeah. from, from Louise. What's your take on what's app for business and are we really underusing it right now? Um, so talking from our experience, I mean, we have, uh, our WhatsApp bot's really big. We have a full, all of our self-service functionality available on it. We have a million users a month. Um, it's grown there from like over the last year. So it's ramped up really big. I, when I look at, uh, someone shared with me like what the top five WhatsApp bots were in South Africa recently, I was a little bit surprised by that because I was expecting some of the other banks and brands to be in that list. So I think, um, so my view on it is, it's an incredibly powerful platform. It's uncluttered, uh, people like it. It's part of their daily lives already. 
Um, the promise of WhatsApp Pay over the next three years is something that is incredibly exciting as well because when you can start combining commerce uh, and messaging together, you get a really powerful thing. Um, but the entry into WhatsApp is actually, like the bar to entry is quite high. It's pretty expensive building bots. Um, it's a different space to the web or, or apps for people to get you know, an understanding around how, how the ecosystem actually works. Um, but it's absolutely worth going in that direction. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for the presentation and for answering that. We only had time for one question, but uh, any other questions, of course, please jump into that, uh, the, the chat room for networking a little bit later with Vincent. But uh, thanks for joining us on this session. If everyone would like to move to the next session and we're going underway with post-COVID-19, what does the world look like now? Vincent Mayer, thank you very much.